There are days here on the Matt Berry Show on the ESPN College Football YouTube channel where we sit on a Sunday morning. Myself, Paul Feinbaum, recap all the ball we saw on Saturday. There are days where you cannot wait to get up early in the morning after working all damn day on Saturday. Paul traveled. I was up till the wee hours uh, to recap what we saw. And Paul, to me, this Sunday is a shifting Sunday in the sport. The lines have shifted in college football. And the first one we're going to start with is Texas, Alabama, mm-hmm. where you cannot leave that field not saying this sentence. Texas is a better football team in 2023 than Alabama. That's 100% accurate. And, and, and Matt, you know, sometimes you get false positives after one week and that a week ago when we were. And you had to do it, raving about Alabama and, and Jalen Milrow. Uh, today, it's it's the completely opposite. And you know, where does this program go? Uh, and and how big of a controversy do they have a quarterback? And frankly, does it really even matter? Because uh, if you're if you're looking if you're looking at Alabama objectively, you know, I mean, are are they really a serious playoff team anymore? I mean, I, and I, I know that sounds. Uh, you know, really crass uh, in the early morning hours afterwards. But you tell me, uh, for the, they can't lose again uh, and make the playoffs. And 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 what what is the likelihood of that? Which, by the way, would include uh, a Georgia game. Yeah, and and we were watching that game in studio. I had touched on this over Bloody Marys uh, this morning, and and looking at Jalen Miller on the Alabama offense. Paul, there just there wasn't any punch. There wasn't any rhythm. There wasn't any threat that this Alabama team could take off at any point. Now, having said that, there look, you're not going to show up, roll the ball out every week, and have explosive plays and just roll everybody. You're just not going to do that. Texas is a very formidable opponent, and they're the better team. Now they did stay in the game. Alabama got plenty of opportunities to stay in the sure. game, but I don't think Paul. I I wasn't watching that game, and I know you weren't. And other people weren't watching that game, expecting anything but. Milro on a broken play to run, create problems, find a guy open. I thought that was the only way that Alabama was going to be able to stay in this game because they just didn't, there wasn't anything there that said, Ooh, big play coming. Ooh, first down. There just wasn't anything there. No. And and, and what was particularly interesting is that Texas had a chance to really put some distance early in the game. They couldn't do it. And you, you kept every time they did not get a touchdown, you kept saying, you better mark that. Yep. Uh, and you saw what happened. Alabama, after in, in spite of all these things that we have said and will be said, still came back, took the lead, uh, and then they did it to themselves. And and that's probably the most frustrating thing if you're an Alabama fan today. I think it was only 10 penalties versus 17 last year. But, you know, two took seven points off the board. Um, and it's just – how many times have I heard and you heard me? Uh, hey, you got to you got to take a look at this offensive line from Alabama. They're the biggest. They're the, the heaviest. They're the greatest, and they got beaten to a pulp. So, what does that portend for the rest of the season? Well, and 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 there it is. Because look, what we're TV people, radio people. We we go for the sex appeal. Sex appeal is always offense, and we need that coming in. We'll get to Quinn Ewers on that side of the ball in a minute. But it was the Texas defense for me because you're right. Every single year, Alabama trots out an offensive line that's always up for the Joe Moore Award, which is given to the best offensive line in the country. They always have a receiver room that includes two first-round picks. they got a quarterback that's always going to be drafted in the top 15, and they got a running back that's going to make you pay. And we wondered, after two consecutive years of not making it into the college football playoff, what Alabama could do to stop that run of no playoff success. When you look now at the few, the schedule – Unless unless Buckner gets in there or Ty Simpson gets in there and they continue to make a package for Jalen Milrow, unless something over the next few weeks flips, I don't. Do you see this Alabama team getting out of their schedule without losing another game? No, and, and I'll make it. I'll make it easy for those non-Bama fans in the audience. Uh, a couple weeks from now, Ole Miss comes in. That's an explosive team with uh, with a dynamic quarterback. Uh, then you go to Texas A&M, and, and we'll get to it in a minute, but you know you can read whatever you want into A&M losing, but in Kyle Field, it's a different story. Uh, and, and by the way, I haven't mentioned uh, the better teams on the schedule. Uh, we're talking about Tennessee, uh, LSU, which I, I expect to bounce back. Uh, you, you have tricky games at Kentucky, 
Miss, I mean, you have everybody. I mean, you've got a bunch of all of a sudden Arkansas, Mississippi State games like that, like that you you never really gave much thought to. You have to give you have to say they're in play now. Uh, and and Matt, I, I just think Nick Saban has a real challenge to hold this group together. Uh, you know, how do you how do you figure out the quarterback situation? Uh, I mean, he I, he went all in on Jalen Milro and he, and, he, and he got burned. Uh, because you had to think there was a moment late in that game that uh, that Buckner could have come in and maybe made a big play. Uh, you know, you knew Milrow wasn't going to, and I think it hit Milrow's success kept him in there, but it ended up costing them in the end. Yeah, and and at the end of the day, when you, it's kind of funny because the SEC wins either way. What better? Oh, I don't know. Billboard, could you have for I told you so than, than Texas, who's coming to the conference next year? But it's going to be the highest rated game of the day. They come out. People are like, oh, Texas and Oklahoma. Can Texas really hang in the SEC? Well, yeah. And if that's the game that Sark is like, watch. Watch what we have going. Because now, I, I said this on Sunday Bloody Sunday, Quinn Ewers is a perfect quarterback recruit coming to South Lake Carroll. He was one of the highest rated recruits ever. Starts at Ohio State, comes back to Texas. But now what Sark has, he's got Arch Manning waiting in the wings. He's got all of these things that you need to be a dominant program in the SEC for years to come. Last night, I think, was merely an appetizer of where this thing is headed because they did so in impressive fashion. Every time Alabama got back in the game, Quinn, A.D. Mitchell, and that offense came down and answered, and you're like, wait a second. This is different. This team isn't scared of Alabama on the road, and they're not going anywhere. Don't forget where A.D. Mitchell was playing last year. Georgia. Georgia. Yeah. Um, and you're right, Matt. And what, you know what? I mean, it, it was an amazing day and atmosphere. I mean, everybody. I mean, you, obviously you saw, but even on Friday night in Tuscaloosa, no matter where you went, there was the governor, there was celebrities, there were officials, uh, and there were also every big time recruit in the country. Uh, so, I mean, you, you that's the game you want. I mean, if you're the number one player wherever, you, you're going to be in Tuscaloosa on Saturday night. And if you're the number one, whatever, and you're watching that game, which side do you want to play for? Yeah, because now you've got the uptick Texas. Sark's got him believing. Nick Saban, year 17. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, if you were buying stock in one of these, who who would you buy stock yeah, in? And, and I'm going to, I'm, I made a vow this morning, like, you know, don't get hung up on, on overreaches but so i'll i'll just share with you what i'm hearing from my friends in tuscaloosa and birmingham who have been around a long time uh who watch this and and and, and some are saying this reminds me I'm, I'm quoting them now of 41 years ago and matt i hate going back 41 years especially to a guy that i'm not even sure is 40 years old um <laughs> but uh but that was 1982 in 1982 was Bear Bryant's last year. And it's you, it, they were number two in the country. And then but they made it to the middle of the season before it fell apart. This is the second week. And uh it 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 feels uh, I mean, for let's 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 quit trying to decide whether the dynasty's over or not. Let's try to talk about this era uh, and where that is. And and it's starting to feel uh tenuous. Uh and and there's nothing Nick Saban can do about that. Uh, last night was not going to change the season other than to, you know, prop Alabama up. But by losing to Texas, it, essentially it, it puts Alabama uh, at the very far end of the ledge with no room for error. And it's hard to imagine as we start this conversation that they can they can be flawless the rest of the season. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, their fans can make a case for it, but but I'd love to know with what rationale or reason. Yeah, and here's here's what here's I think we probably know this for certain. We're accustomed to Alabama, even against SEC foes, coming out there and just beating the hell out of them. I don't know that in these games this year that Alabama is not going to be in a tight one yeah. for all four quarters. And how those look close games, they're a coin flip. And what side Alabama is going to be on at the end of that coin flip is going to remains to be seen. But it, look. I'm not going to get on here on Sunday morning and fall victim to hyperbole and say this was a change into the guard. I'll just say, and, and when we were watching with Dan Mullen and Joey, even Mullen said it. He's like, you know what? And Sark called a brilliant game yeah. early and often because Dan Mullen pointed out, and so I love watching games with the, the former head coach who was just in the game. 
when early on when Sark and they were calling these screens out of the backfield and getting those running backs out. It was a four yard pass turning an eight, nine yard gain. He looked at me and he goes, Nick Saban hates that kind of stuff, especially when he doesn't have the speed at safety or linebacker to go get those running backs. And he said, they don't have the speed at those positions right now to come get those guys. And that says a lot. Yeah. And Matt, uh, to, to the bigger picture, uh, when I heard somebody say today, this was now the third time Nick Saban has lost to a former assistant. It's starting to become normal. Uh, we went all those years. Yep. And not only was he beating assistants, he was averaging about 20 point margin. And now uh, in, in two games into the into the third season of this set of, of, of you know, he lost to Jimbo two years ago. He lost to uh, he, he obviously lost to Kirby Smart. Uh, and now he's lost this game and it won't be the last time he loses to a former assistant. And, 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 and I think if you're Nick Saban this morning, you're trying to correct the problems, but you're also beginning to wonder, uh, how much damage, uh, could I be doing to my legacy? Uh, and I realize that sounds like an overreach and that sounds hyper, but it's really not though. Uh, these things collapse very quickly, Matt. And, you know, fans, fans need hope last yeah. year. They lost to Tennessee on the final play in a game that we all know they should have won. I mean, that that was that was absurd how that happened. And then the LSU game, they were the better team. They let it slip away in overtime. And, and, and even though Alabama almost lost three other games, including Texas, the, the fans hung their hat on, and Saban did too when he campaigned for the playoffs. We lost two games in on the final play. Uh, we are, what are we, September 10th? Yeah. That's already been taken out of his repertoire. He lost by 10 points at home, and it should have been 20. First double-digit loss as a head coach at home since 2003. And here, you want something symbolic of the loss? They didn't get beat uh, with a big touchdown at the end of the game. They didn't get beat with Texas sacking Jalen Milrow. They ended the game. It was cemented in victory for Texas with a player for Alabama jumping off sides. That's how the game was won. And if you're talking about end of an era, or maybe the end of the legacy for Nick Saban there in Tuscaloosa, you know, he, he does do commercials with a pretty popular head coach right now. I mean, is Tuscaloosa ready for prime? Oh, that's, that's ridiculous. I I, I mean, I had a, I, I had a colleague ask me today, and this is, this is where we are on the morning after who do you think the top three candidates would be if, quote unquote, Nick Saban retired. And and I don't know if Prime is on that list or not, uh, but why not? Why are you kidding me? If I if I were a, now we're gonna spin off into a tangent here, but that's what we do here on the on the YouTube channel. If I were a a program of top 10 power, right? If I'm one of the most powerful programs in the country and for whatever reason a coaching switch is in the cards, Paul, Deion Sanders is my number one call, and I'm not even thinking Correct. twice about it. Like, why wouldn't you? I don't care who you are. Yeah, when you, when you, when you well, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get too deep into the weeds here. When I, when I was trying to think of some of the names, I mean, they, they're all just nice coaches, but none of them have uh, the star power. I mean, let, let, quite frankly, Nick Saban doesn't have the star power that Deion Sanders has right now. I mean, this thing is like the way that he's taken. Look, Colorado could very well finish two and 10. They won't, but they could, right? And then whatever that shine. I have talked to so many people out West and I've talked to everybody in this industry. What Dion has done is he has surrounded himself with a staff that is really, really good at football. His offensive coordinator, Sean Lewis, is going to get a job somewhere at some point. All he's done, Paul, is bring in talent make everybody believe, roll out a football and win. And I am convinced of it. I'll say two things. One, if a big time job comes open tomorrow, Deion Sanders will be the number one candidate. And I said this during commercial break at sports center. And I think I thought I had the whole staff have a heart attack. I said, you watch NFL jobs are going to start being rumored to Dion, And don't think for a second, Jerry Jones wouldn't love the splash of a Deion Sanders in his program at the Cowboys. Yeah. I mean, that, that would hard knocks would have to camp out there for a while. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but I mean, you're hundred percent right, Matt. And you know, there are a lot of regrets out there, but you know, think, you know, inside baseball here for a second, you know, game day going to a campus is like a very big deal. The yeah. Fox show, the, I've never been at a Fox noon show. Uh, don't even know who's on there, but they're both at Boulder this week for a truly unforgettable game. Uh, Colorado state. I mean, you, you couldn't have gotten game day to, uh, a one loss Colorado State Colorado game uh, at any moment in history uh, that that would I mean you, you would have gotten laughed out of the uh, production office. I'm almost convinced I'd have to go to my game day stat sheet here, but I, Colorado State's never been a part of anything college yeah. game day related, and now they get the show because of the guys they're playing. And speaking of a program where uh, the coaching could be tenuous at best right now with who they have as the head coach. That's where we get to Jimbo Fisher, Texas A&M, and Miami. I thought this Saturday, Paul, was a good opportunity to get to know and learn something about some of these teams that we didn't learn anything from in week one. And that goes for Miami. Week Year two, Mario Cristobal needed a statement win to make people believe. But year six, Jimbo Fisher, five stars everywhere, coaching staff changes on the road against a team they have more talent than – Paul, Texas A&M didn't get beat. They got pummeled by Miami. They did. And and I, I it was about a year ago on this uh, podcast, Matt, when I called the Miami program a fraud. I think they had lost to Middle Tennessee or somebody. It, it was ugly, yeah. And uh, I got I, I got a text uh, the next morning from from Mario Cristobal going, "Hey man, like come on, <laughs> like, do you have any idea what we're what we're trying to accomplish, what we're doing here?" And and other and the translation of that is, we need to run off about three quarters of this place before we can move forward. And he was right. Uh, and and I, I was really glad to see that because I'm a big fan of his. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I know I've avoided, I've avoided your question by by pontificating about Mario Cristobal, but he deserves it though. Mario deserves credit this morning. But the situation with AM now become tenuous is a good word because with every game now, uh, the microscope is back on. I mean, all the attention about Bobby Petrino, that really, that that, that accomplished absolutely nothing. Um, and it, it proves that we read so much into first games that don't mean anything, Matt. That's why I thought yesterday was important. I thought you had to learn who these teams are after these these horribly week one scheduled games. And Connor Wegman, I get it. I mean, I don't know how many times Palmer and Tess could say it. Five-star quarterback, highly ranked for quarterback. All right, well, Tyler Van Dyke threw five touchdowns and looked sure. better. Texas A&M has more talent. I speak with Mario. Like, yeah. it, like Mario wouldn't argue with that. He'd be sitting right here and be like, yeah, they have more talent. They do. And you can't go and get thumped no. the way you got thumped. And – Going into the weekend, I said for Texas, if not now, when for Sark, right? Well, I'm going to apply that to Texas A&M. I, year six, you, if not Paul now, like w- w- when? Yeah, and and, and Matt, I, I, one thing that happened yesterday that may have been more important to this conversation than even the result in Miami, and that was the first conversation. If Texas really is back, that's a problem for Jimbo Fisher, because in that state, yeah, you you could say who cares about Texas while uh, A and M was uh, in you know, getting you know getting used to the SEC, but Texas is in the SEC now, uh, and you that that was the greatest source of pride for the Aggies. We got in the SEC, we had Johnny Manziel, we beat Alabama, we did we didn't do a lot of great things, but we did a couple of good things while Texas was was mired in mediocrity. And because of us, they decided to get in the SEC. That that, that, that was all the narrative. It's that's that's it. gone now. That's shattered. Uh, and in, in one night in, in, in Tuscaloosa, uh, Sark moved forward and Jimbo Fisher on the way home had to be sick to his stomach realizing what that means to him because it, it, adds, it adds significant pressure now. Is this is it is it going to work? I mean, are they what if you're an if you're an A and M fan? Give me the light at the end of this dark, dark, yeah. dark Sunday morning tunnel. Well, I mean, every conversation about Jimbo Fisher starts. I feel, I feel like we're on Wall Street on uh, Jim Cramer's report. Uh, but <laughs> you have to talk about money, uh, and at at some point, A and M officials have to look in and go, "Oh, 
are we going to let $75 million affect the progress of this program? And I, 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 I'll I try to avoid the, I don't know where this goes from here. This was a terrible loss. Uh, it, it can be overcome with a win over Alabama, a win yep. over Arkansas, momentum. But it, if it's not, then I, I would think at the end of the season, if, if A&M is looking at a mediocre record, that that seventy five million will not be a factor. Uh, I do. I, I've maintained that for a long time. That's a factor if it's a close call. Last year, uh, to Jimbo's credit, uh, I, I give Ross Bjork credit. Uh, the athletic, yeah. he did a very good job of protecting Jimbo Fisher. You know, remember the A and M president uh, has been replaced, so she she was fired a few weeks ago. So there's a little bit of a transition there. But as you you and I both know. Presidents don't make those decisions at places like Texas and A and M. It's it's the guys in the it's the guys with the with the cowboy hats. Right. And uh, I I don't I don't think you'll be able to survive if, if they don't reach a certain mark. And I don't I, Matt. It's a little bit hard to tell on September 10th what that number is. But if they if they are losing games like this on a consistent basis, then he has no future. Yep. And and breaking it down just just big picture. They have the talent to win every game that they're in, whether or not they can. That remains to be seen over the next three months of the season. But Saturday is certainly not a vote of confidence if you're thinking that AM could have been a sleeper team uh, in the SEC West. Which brings me to the final topic because, you know, we get so caught up in one matchup here, one matchup there, one game, one final score. But as I sit there and look big picture, Paul, going into the season, I think you and I would have sat here and said the three best teams in the SEC West, apologies, Lane Kiffin, don't come about us about this later. The three best teams in the SEC West, LSU already got thumped against Florida State, oh. Alabama, double digit loss to Texas, and now Texas A&M, double digit loss to Miami. The three best teams in the SEC West have already gone down to non-conference opponents by double digits in the first two weeks of the season. It's remarkable, and uh, as you look ahead to this coming weekend, there's a game on there, and you know, you know what, you, you know which game it is. That there will be enormous pressure on the head coach, and that sounds crazy because it's only his second season. But there, there are a lot of games will be pressure on the head coach. But the idea of, of Brian Kelly taking his team in for an 11 a.m. start in Starkville uh, that is scary. I, I I know you Mississippi State survived last night. Yes. Uh, and that, that may not make you feel better about them, uh, in terms of beating LSU, but, but the environment will be insane. I've been to a, co a couple of those 11 o'clock games and uh, that 11 o'clock may affect some fans, not, not, in, not in Starkville. That's, that's late in the day. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I, I think I, my eyes are on that one very closely. Now, obviously a lot of other games, including, uh, the, the Billy Napier saga hosting with Tennessee. Uh, those are, I think those are two ESPN games that you'll be, uh, married to. Yeah. And when you look at it, when you, with the Florida, Tennessee, that that's always a game that if you go back to yesterday year, you and I are college football nerds and go back to Phil Fulmer, Steve Spurrier days, yeah. T Martin, Peyton Manning, uh, Rex Gross, when all those, uh, the Florida quarterbacks from yesteryear that used to be a game that decided the sec East. That's not the yeah. case anymore because of Georgia's dominance. But while I have you, since you brought that up, I believe that Josh Heupel could do two things. One say, you know what? Told you Milton's my guy. Mm -hmm. He's a hell of a quarterback. Number two told you Tennessee is in a healthy football spot. Conversely, if he beats down Florida and we're sitting here this Sunday morning talking about, you know, Jimbo's got to get things going. If you're Billy Napier, you're who's better. Who's in a better spot year two right now this morning than Mario Cristobal. Who's going to be in a worse spot in year two come next Sunday. If this game's not even competitive. Yeah. I, uh, here I go. I, after telling myself I wouldn't go go into overdrive, but I but I'm going to because this is a must win game for Billy Napier. Now you can interpret that any way you want. Yeah. Uh, because he he's got a thirty million dollar price tag, uh, and Scott Strickland, uh, the very the very outstanding athletic director down there, has been behind him, and I think he can he can he can save him and get him to the next season. But in terms of the noise, he can't. Nobody can stop the noise for Billy Napier. 
if this game goes poorly. And I'm not I'm not saying uh, I'm not I'm not promoting a moral victory <laughs> at Florida. And by the way, Steve Spurrier has reminded me every time I've ever seen him that he was four and zero against Peyton Manning. <laughs> Sounds we're talking <laughs> we're talking the 90s here okay we're not talking about <laughs> yesterday so that this game matters greatly uh and if for some reason tennessee goes in there and just lays one on them the noise next sunday morning for billy napier uh, in terms of believing he can get the job done will be loud yeah this is i mean that's not great because I, I genuinely like billy but th- th- this is great that we're already in week two and there are little cracks across the college football map of programs, teams, and storylines. It Paul, it doesn't take long for these to bubble up. But, but Matt and the, the guy, I mean, there, there are a lot of coaches that may, I mean, Heifel may, has made it difficult for some coaches how quickly he got things done. But there's one coach who's making it impossible for everyone, and that's Coach Prime. I mean, you can't say, uh, as, as athletic directors tell you and me all the time, you know, we need time. Uh, it's, going to, it's going to take a couple of years. The transfer portal is your best friend or your greatest enemy. And uh, if you're Billy Napier, you can't say, uh, you know, we got this thing going in the right direction. Uh, it, that's that, that's that, that doesn't play in a fan base and anybody who's seen draft, uh, I said draft Kings, Swamp Kings, uh, probably su- uh, sponsored by draft Kings. Uh, <laughs> if you, I mean, I was talking to Tebow the other day uh, and, and he, he was telling me a story about the end of, of, of Swamp Kings when he walks into the swamp uh, and the score, and it points up there and it says Gators, national champions 2006 and 2009 and he said the fact that excuse me 2006 and 2008 and he said the fact that it doesn't say 09 is is one of the greatest regrets of my life i mean that's a guy who who's to this day what 15 years later is still angry over not winning three national championships in four years and billy napier can't even get a significant win it it look it is a, an era, which, by the way, back in Tebow's era at Florida, social media was primitive. Yeah, so you didn't have all of this, this uh, promotion, self promotion, and 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 fans yelling, screaming. But right now, if Deion Sanders, if he wanted to, which he does, because you hit on it there, Portal is a coach's best friend. If Deion wants to, he can take over college football. And, it's, it's that yeah. simple. If he wants to and just pick and choose and say, player X at this school, why don't you come on in? I got you. Who's going to tell him no? No, you're right. Uh, and uh, I, mean, I mean, Matt, uh, we're still, I mean, no matter what we talk about, we're going to end on Dion. Um, and it is, it, it, there are very few phenomenons in any, in any, in any platform uh, we see it occasionally in the entertainment world. We see it in very, in politics. We see it in, 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 in the arts. But in college football, the, the idea of someone coming in and being the only topic of conversation. I mean, I, I had a really, uh, I, had, I had a squeeze the other day. I had, I had something to do for uh, ESPN at, at 1030. I was on with uh, First Take. Um, and I had an eye appointment. Uh, at 8 30 and, and i get you know you get in they dilate your eyes uh, and at nine o'clock the, the doctor walks in and he goes hey man what about this thing with Deion sanders and i said how about just checking my eye and getting me out of here okay <laughs> i don't want to talk to you about Deion sanders because i mean it doesn't matter who you are where you are that's the conversation and and, and that's what that's scary if you're billy napier if you're even if you're nick saban uh, because he he may come and get your player if he wants it. He, he is a generational disruptor to a sport that we've long loved and followed, and I think it's good for the sport to get a little bit of disruption. Having said all of that, that means I will bet a paycheck on it. SEC Nation's got to be going to Colorado next week, right? We are. Uh, it, it, it's the first <laughs> time in history that we have two non-SEC schools, but uh, we can't help it. Uh, we, we have to be there. Sankey ordained it because right at the end of the day, he's going to be like, hey, Prime, you want to come play in the Southeastern Conference from Boulder, Colorado? Hey, great stuff. Uh, what a Saturday it was. I am anxiously nervous, if that's even a phrase, sleep exhaustion, to know what the topics will be next Sunday because little by little they're starting to unfold, and here we are week two of the college football season. 
Paul Fine Mom and the Matt Berry Show on a Sunday. Uh, Paul, have a great week. Look forward to doing this again with you. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.